right. Well, we want to just continue our discussion here about uh, the text of the Bible and its reliability. And one of the uh, individuals that has kind of come out in, in the media and people have heard of is Bart Ehrman. Uh, uh, Bart has basically is a wonderful textual sc uh, scholar, uh, but uh, he has drawn some conclusions that we would we would uh, disagree with. Uh, fundamentally, uh, what uh, Dr. Ehrman um, suggests is that the text of the New Testament is unreliable because it's been copied and copied and copied and copied. Uh, so he basically is suggesting that because of all of the copies, we can't have any notion that we have a reliable text of the New Testament. And I think that's something we ought to talk about a little bit. So uh, let's do that. Let's, let's take on that whole idea that the text of the New Testament can't be relied upon because it's, there have been many copies. How do we respond to that? Well, I, I guess I would begin by saying, you know, we talked about the Old Testament and uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls mm -hmm. and, and how that showed how the text was accurately transmitted over a long period of time. The New Testament, the evidence is, is actually even more substantial in terms of it's, it's first of all, it's closer to, the, to our time period of the events that occurred, but there are not just a handful of manuscripts, but literally thousands of different manuscripts that have been discovered in Greek, which is the original language of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them uh, dated within a very reasonable period of time to the events of the New mm -hmm. Testament period. Um, uh, in various forms of complete books in some cases, uh, we have many full, complete copies of the, of the New Testament itself, and then fragments. Uh, some of them very ancient, like one from John that goes all the way back to less than 30 years from John's lifetime uh, that has been discovered. And so, um, and when the, the scholars study all this and they, and they put all of this evidence together, uh, and many of them are not Christian scholars. They, they just do the science of looking at the text and trying to determine what the original text said. Um, the opposite is the case of what Mr. Ehrman is claiming that we don't know. We can have a high degree of certainty that we have in our hands the New Testament text that was originally written by the apostles and those who were in, in the, the, the apostolic ministry at the time of Jesus and following. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of extraordinary that the evidence indicates the exact opposite of what Mr. Ehrman is saying that it is. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, Instead of being skeptical about it, we actually, just humanly speaking, can have a great deal of confidence about these texts. Yes, that's uh, right. A very high degree of, of certainty with almost no major doctrine being to, uh, at question at all. Mm -hmm. Mostly variations in spelling and stylistic differences that are meaningless in terms small of details, small, small details. Small details. Yes. Um, Mr. Ehrman will say something like there's 400,000 or something like that uh, variations in the New Testament, yeah. but over 95% of those are just spellings, yeah. uh, slips of the, of the pen by a scribe that are obvious. Yeah. And so he grossly overstates mm -hmm. um, uh, the problem of, of it. He uses that number to, to create yeah. uh, a, 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 really a false impression amongst people who are reading it or aren't familiar with it. That's right, and, 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 but that impression has found its way through our culture, through a lot of media sources, and it's a very, very unfortunate thing because the reality is the New Testament text is a sound text, and the copying of it uh, we have in our hands. Again, when you open up your English Bible, you're reading what was written by the, uh, by the original writers. And, and again, the whole, the whole subject of studying the copies of the copies of the copies. Well, that's an interesting thing for some, some of us to do. It's fascinating. But the conclusion that the Bible's, or the New Testament has completely changed, there's no basis for that. Now, one other uh, side argument that's often uh, discussed is this idea that the early church only took the writings of certain people and pushed the, they pushed all the Gnostic writings out. And we see Gnostic uh, stuff about Gnostic writings constantly anymore uh, on, on various uh, TV specials, whether you're watching you know, something on the History Channel or, or something on National Geographic or wherever it might come from, their Discovery Channel, all these different sources, they may have 
allude to the Gnostic writers. And they say that, well, we don't have any of their writings and the, the, uh, what we have is just a collection of very biased materials. How do we respond to that kind of accusation, that kind of statement? Well, I think the early church pretty much purged anything that was contrary to the revelation we received from Christ himself, mm -hmm. the Gospels, and uh, the Apostle Paul and the, the early uh, writers of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, we have certain doctrines that are laid out there. And the, uh, the early church, well, what we refer to as the church fathers, they were quick to s squash anything yes. that was what we would say heretical, was uh, in opposition to those very early fundamental teachings. Yes. Yes. And so, you know, they claim, oh, well, this wasn't allowed in that. Well, there's a reason why it wasn't allowed exactly. in. Exactly, <laughs> yes, yes. It, It's yeah. contrary yeah. to the Christian message and Christian doctrine. Yeah. Mr. Ehrman uses that argument, uh, tries to use it against the faith. Uh, it's interesting you say that. That, that is true. If, if, if what we accept to be true is that God spoke through the writers, then there were certain doctrines that were true, and then there's other documents that were not inspired by God, which would necessarily not be correct. He, he is assuming that that's, that dynamic is not taking place, <laughs> that these are human documents. Yes, that's right. And that human beings used various political and power sources to push those out, out of the church. So in a manner of speaking, he, he takes what you're saying, which is true. The church fathers were protecting the church and trying to discern what books were genuinely from God, and tries to turn that on its ear when it's not yeah. really the case. It's an assumption that it's a human work. That's the fundamental problem yeah. where he's coming from. Now he's talking about, I mentioned Gnostic books. A lot of people don't, may not know what that is. Some examples of that might be the Gospel of Judas or the Gospel of Thomas. And uh, there's been a number of them that have actually gotten some notoriety. But Mr. Ehrman wants to say, well, those should have been included. But the church, the church decided for good reason that they should be rejected. Because right. they do fall, because any, any, anyone who understands what's in those documents knows that they fall outside of uh, our, our orthodox faith. Orthodox meaning what we believe the Bible says, what Jesus said, what the apostles taught. And so it was only normal and natural and proper for them to show that kind of discernment and make sure that those books were excluded from the text of the New Testament. Well, and you said the church, you guys mentioned the church fathers. I don't want people to think this is a bunch of grumpy old men yeah. who just, anything they didn't like got rid of. Really, truly, in, in each church all over the, in, in, in Cairo and in Constantinople and in Rome and in Jerusalem and in mm -hmm. Antioch, the church, they, they, they would read the different texts and they would they would talk about it, and they would decide. And each church said, "This just isn't right." Mm -hmm. And they would talk to some another church, and they said, "Well, we we agree with you. That's not right." And they chose. They said, "This these books speak to us in a way that that these books don't." You know, and I would just say to people who are struggling with these very issues, um, uh, "Well, I, I heard what." Ehrman said, and, I, and, and there, are, there are questions, and I, and I acknowledge there are these points that we, that we uh, haven't been able to settle, and we don't always agree. But I would say, like the early church, read the Bible yourself. Mm -hmm. See if God doesn't talk to you. And then pick up one of those Gnostic Gospels and read it. Yeah. And see if you get the same sense of God talking to you like you get from scripture from one of those books. They're out there, they're available. Check them out yourself, and I think you'll get a sense of there's something special about this Bible stuff versus these other things. Yes. That's what the early church did. Uh, yeah, I would, add, I would add to that too when you talk about the grumpy old men of the early church, you know, <laughs> that's a sort of a misperception. There are figures in, in the early church, uh, significant figures, leaders in the early yeah. church, and their writings have been preserved. And anytime that they talk about the text of the New Testament, different books, John, or a book that's not part of the, what we call the canon today, like the Gospel of Thomas, mm -hmm. they never say 
that the church made the decision or the church determined or the church chose. It's always words like received, passed down, mm-hmm. given. There's a passive uh, terms are used to describe the process of the church trying to figure out which books yeah. were from God and which weren't. Yeah. And that assumes they believed that God had written, was the ultimate author yeah. of the text. Yeah. It's never this active decision making, but a passive reception. Yes. And Mr. Ehrman and many others turn that around and make it sound like the church used its power to push these other things out, and they picked the right. books that Good were point. best to their own sensibilities. Yeah. And so yes. this has been thoroughly documented, too, by, by Christian scholars who've studied this subject. Yes. And uh, so that's important, uh, that how the church fathers viewed the reception of the text. Very important so, point. Uh, Henry, if we hear on tonight's uh, evening news that a new document has been found in Egypt dating to the first century and it gives a different description of Christ than what we have in the Bible, Right. we know that's spurious. It's mm-hmm. not part of the canon. It's something right. that was rejected by the church and we don't need to pay any attention to it. Right. It's, and, it's... and many times, Brant, we know that it's spurious because we know someone put someone else's name on the book. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, they, they would name these books after famous people. Sure. Uh, and, and so we know it's nonsense right from the get-go right. because it was someone trying to make a name for themselves or to try to add some crazy new idea, and the church rejected it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And in fact, the very use of the word Gnostic, G-N-O-S-T-I-C, the, the, the G is silent, in fact, you put an A in front of that word in, in English, you negate the word, you have agnostic. Yes. And agnostic means I don't know. Gnostic means to know. And Gnostics thought they had a special corner on the truth. Yeah. Now, sometimes some of us get accused of the same thing, but they thought they had a special understanding that nobody else had, a special understanding about Jesus, about God, and so they had this special information that nobody else could understand unless they bought into their deal. And, and that is what the early church found unacceptable. And it was contrary to what they were reading in the books that they did receive and they did accept. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I would add to that. The, the Gospels tell us a, a whole different story, that anyone is invited to come into the kingdom. And in the sight of God, all people are, are equal. Yeah. We don't have special knowledge. It's special to know Christ, of course. But people are welcome. You don't have to, you don't have to do anything extraordinary. Just believe. Yes. And you can be part of his kingdom. Thank God. <laughs>